Welcome to the dark forest. Jackie and her pals will never bore us. Shameless confessions about our obsession will make us laugh and smile. So let's explore the dark forest and dork down for a while. Hello and welcome to the dork forest. It's Jackie Cation. You know the websites jackiecation.com, dorkforest.com, thedorkforest.com. Family Pet Ancestry dot com. Yes. Anyway, you know the credits possibly already, but let's do them. Uh, Mike Rickberg composed and sang the Dork Forest theme song. He sang it with his girlfriend Sarah Cohen. He will sing the Mexican Hat Dance song. Lyrics made up by him at the end of the program. You may uh, buy some merch this month if you're into it. The uh, do- at JackieCation dot com. There is a store page which has Ranger of the Dork Forest T-shirts uh, designed by Sam and Bemel Benrude, my nephew, and uh, Dork Force t-shirts designed by Brett Chambers, and they are both uh, made in the United States by union workers and then printed at a non-union shop in Alabama. Interesting. Interesting choice, Jackie. Anyway, but they're, they're perfectly nice people at Mammoth Printing in Alabama. So that's, uh, we're working towards, uh, sustainable. Anyway, um, then there's CDs and DVDs on that page as well. My new CD DVD is called This Will Make an Excellent Horcrux. You can get the CD, which is Saturday night second show. You can get the DVD, which is Friday night second show and has about 10 more minutes on it with a bonus thing and it has the pictures. And then you could just rip that audio. Uh, on your computer, and then you'd have both sort of a CD and a DVD. I don't know why I'm suggesting that, but it's super fun. You can also, when you order from Amazon, if you use the Amazon banner on JackieCation.com, on the right-hand side, white banner, it's just a portal, gets you into the door, uh, gets you into Amazon. You order like normal, and then I get a kickback for your order. Very exciting, and it's a way to support the show if you like. Uh, I usually ask if you donate, that you donate to the Dork Forest. This month, I ask that you do not donate to the Dork Forest, and you take the 10 20 or 100 bucks that you might give to the Dork Forest, and you find a food bank. Because, you know, food banks need money. So Google the name of your town, city, or village, and the words food bank, and it turns out it will pop up. And then you can <laughs> give that amount of money to them. Or you can bring them food, one of the two. If you give them money, uh, my sister, Darlication, or Cash In, as she likes to pronounce it, uh, is they will, uh, they'll buy the food they want, or you can just bring them food. And there's usually a list of what they're looking for. It is December, my calendar this week. This week, I'm going to be in Ann Arbor, Michigan at the Ann Arbor Comedy Showcase new venue. Very glamorous, very exciting. I really like that town and I really like, um, that club. So if you're in Michigan and near Ann Arbor, come and see me, uh, the week of whatever that is. I think it's the ninth and then new year's Eve, which is going to be the 31st. Uh, I'm in Phoenix opening for Brian Regan at some fancy theater. You can check the calendar page on Jackiecation.com for all that information. And then in January, I'm going to be in New York city doing the New York city pod fest. And you can get tickets to that. And that'll be super fun. It'll be two for one that night for like 15 bucks. You can see my podcast and Matt Bronger's podcast And I don't have a guest yet, but I have uh, some feelers out for some fun guests. And then I'm just going to be doing a bunch of shows in New York City, and I'll keep you posted as to what those are. Let's get into the show, folks. It's a good one. Really is. Hello, Rangers. My name is Joe Wilson, and some of you might recognize my voice from the first two years of The Dork Forest when I co-hosted with Jackie. I left the forest to tell stories, and I'd like to tell you one. This story is both a live-action series and a graphic novel. The live-action series has cast members like Marsha Wallace, who was the voice of Edna Krabappel on The Simpsons, Kirsten Vangs Ness, who you might know as Penelope Garcia on Criminal Minds. The story is about Don, a hitman who dies, does the whole light at the end of the tunnel thing, and hears the voices of people he killed, and comes back to life very inspired not to die, ever. So he arranges to become a vampire, and never planned on biting his wife, but then he got hungry, and his wife bit her mother, who is now moving in for eternity. Vampire Mob. It's a comedy, a drama, has a little action, a lot of swearing, (laughs) and uh, you can watch and read it right now for free at VampireMob.com. Thanks. I hope you enjoy it. VampireMob.com. Hey, it's Jackie Cation. I'm in my living room here in Van Nuys. Very glamorous. I am with uh, Joseph Scrimshaw. Hello. Exactly like it sounds. Yep. S-C-R-I-M-S-H-A-W. Yep. At Joseph Scrimshaw uh, on Twitter, on Facebook, josephscrimshaw.com. 
Uh, you uh, are comedian. Yes. You are writer. You yes. are actor. And let us ta- speak briefly of your dorkdoms. I I want to start with the Star Wars prequels. Okay. You are a defender of the Star Wars prequels. Yes. How so? How, I, did, how did it happen? I am a defender of one's ability to enjoy them for the shit that they are. I do not okay. argue that they're good. Okay. By any standard definition of good. Okay. <laughs> by any standard definition of good. No, no, I don't think that. I don't think that. I, it's very hard to to you know any art you can't really judge objectively. But right. any way in which you can judge something objectively, sure. they're poor. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Starting with this as a basis and moving <laughs> forward, let us speak briefly of the first one called, I can't even remember. I didn't see the third one. <laughs> oh, it's called The Phantom Menace, the, the first fan- one. The first one is The Phantom Menace. And All then right. Attack of the Clones. Clones, that's right. Uh, and then Revenge of the Sith. Revenge of the Sith. And I think they get incrementally better. I've I've heard that. I've heard that about that the third one was the best of the three. Yes. And uh, it still wasn't great. It has one at least actually for for real good scene. Oh, really? Yep. All right. What was it? Uh, it is where Palpatine is sort of uh, emotionally seducing Anakin oh, okay. uh, while they're watching a Mon Calamari fish ballet. Okay. So they're watching the ballet. Yes. You can't really tell because it's just kind of CGI bubbles. And then every once in a while, something that looks kind of like Admiral Akbar <laughs> floats around in the bubble. That's not really, I mean, that, wow. that's just background. Well, that, thank God that's background <laughs> because A, you know the name of that person, that, yes. na- that species. And then, uh, and then also, wow. Okay. Uh, that is, <laughs> that is mind blowing to have it described having never saw it. It makes you want to go CGI. That sounds like in the Mary Poppins movie. <laughs> Remember when they go, they jump into the into, in, into the chalk art. Yeah. And then they go, and then there's dancing and Dick Van Dyke and yeah. Billy Andrews. That's what it kind of reminds me. Except it's for the CGI like is that. better. Uh, yeah, a but little not murky. Really? Not a little really? murky. It could have used some Dick Van Dyke. Excellent, excellent. Uh, can everything? Yeah, yeah. But the the good part of it is that it is actually like an emotionally effective scene. Okay. Uh, the actor who plays Palpatine, uh, Ian McDermott, he's he's a really good actor, and he plays really subtly and really well. What what the should the dark side be? That sort of that oh. that longing for if you just had a little bit more power, right? You could stop all these bad things from happening. So. Wouldn't you want to just bend the rules a little bit? All you oh, need to really? do is just bend the rules a little bit, Anakin, and then everything will be fine. And, and like, then you can fix everything. Yeah, and it was it was one of the only times in the prequels where you're like, oh, okay, I can imagine why a guy would, would turn do to that. the dark side. Okay. Wow, all right. Well, I think we own the three prequels. Uh, maybe I'll <laughs> fast forward to that one. I think you should. I'm told that there was a couple of screaming at the skies in that one. There was... Yes, there's a really unfortunate Frankenstein homage. <laughs> At the end with Darth Vader, it's a, it, you know, and this is this is the kind of the prequels in the nutshell. Yeah, they're very very visually beautiful. Okay, and they're very sort of idiosyncratic. They're clearly made by a person, right? And kind of a crazy person at oh, this point, really? and un, with unchecked power, Lucas. right? Uh, and so there are moments of just like huge beauty, and like the shot of the mask coming on Anakin's face. You right, know, it's it's haunting and mesmerizing and then then darth vader rises and there's steam and then (laughs) there's steam there's steam good steam uh good good steam painful steam dark side steam okay and uh in the end yes when he finds out that his wife uh padme is dead and that he has killed her according to palpatine he you know screams no right in the most on darth vader like way Right, in more of a Wolverine screaming at the sky twice in that yes. horrible I Wolverine movie. I can't think of any good example of, of screaming, screaming to the, the in the sky in an actual serious way. Mocking it, always right. good. Right, <laughs> always good, always good. <laughs> I know, it. and the thing is, is I'm almost willing to give a movie one of those. Yes. but and Because I, I don't know how else you would do it. If you are told to scream into the sky, maybe you take a twist on it you do your own thing maybe like an ian mckellen or somebody might might decide to scream into the dirt uh <laughs> like you're 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 cursing the devil instead of the lord yes and cuz i i don't know how you would make that your own that and that's the thing with it is james earl jones good actor yeah but they should have just included like the pre-roll where he goes you want me to do what <laughs> okay i'll try cuz that's the subtext of the no it's got a question mark at the end of it like oh, no was that good enough? I don't want to do this, George. Right, right. So, 
And now, so okay, so there was a there was a good one in the Re- there there was one good scene in Revenge <laughs> of the Sith. But yes. and what else did you like? Let's just do them backwards. What else did you like about Revenge? Let's do the best of them. Uh, or should we start? Should we go back to Phantom Menace and say what was good about Phantom Menace? What I think Phantom like Menace for me is partially just I enjoyed that time of my life and that time of geekdom right. where there was just a huge explosion well, of Star Wars stuff everywhere, and I just crossed that line of like I know it's not good. But I find myself thinking about it anyway. And right. isn't that part of art? That it, and, and you're right at that cuspy age, too, where you're like, this will do. Because yeah. I love this universe. Yeah, and Which I is... came to that point where, like, I want to play video games with dudes with lightsabers. And yeah. I liked Obi-Wan Kenobi in the movie. And I like thinking about him and why he did, why yeah. he made the poor choices he did. <laughs> right, right. More poor choices being made. <laughs> yes. And weird. But, yeah, because Dan Telfer uh, actually... Uh, a dinosaur dork has been on yes. the dork forest. He he posted. He said, "You cannot ruin the next three dork for uh, Star Wars for me because I love the universe. Yes, and any stories that take place in that universe, I'm on board. Yeah. I'm in. Is and that sort of that's kind of- sort of what it was about? And and I think especially that first one in '99 and going into 2000, I collected yeah. the action figures. I played the video games. It was like Stockholm syndrome, where I was sort of like, <laughs> this thing has captured right. me. Yes, it's not good." But I kind of love it anyway. Right. And now I feel like I'm having a resurgence as Disney is coming in. Right. And I've watched the first several episodes of the Star Wars Rebels, the animated series. Oh, yeah? And it's the first thing that Disney has made. Okay. And it's hitting all the notes but playing none of the music. Okay. And it feels like it's been put together by a committee Uh, of like, ah, we've analyzed that you like this line from the trilogy. We like... We know uh, that you like it when there's that somebody looking into the horizon. You like that, right? So <laughs> it's it, so, so it's made me appreciate, even though Lucas is not good, it's still very human. Okay, it's like you can sense that one crazy person made this, <laughs> as opposed to a committee of people yes. who are determined to do it correctly. <laughs> Right. So it's got that going for it because the Lego um, series or the the Star Wars series animated series is just okay. It, yeah. it again looks good, but it isn't really. Is it because the thing is, is what needs to be done to some extent? Is it a committee? Do you think it's a committee of fifty-year-old men who were there when it all began, and they're like, "Well, we're going to make sure these nine things that weren't in the things that I loved, we're going to make sure those are going to be in it." Yeah, it. Yeah, it just seems a little. Yes, I think there's that, but then I think there's that sort of that Disney side of it of like there's lots of there's wacky hijinks. Uh oh. Well, like the droid is cute and annoying right and then the sort of wookie standing character is always wanting to beat up the droid so it has this almost like scooby-doo sort of old style like (laughs) i'm enjoying the story and then there's got to be a scene where the wookie like character goes why i ought to to the droid to the annoying droid Yeah, because there's always secondary characters that are these hilarious uh and that is in quotes my friends (laughs) uh some sort of hilarious like disney kind of character instead of just sort of playing it straight. I mean, because Lucas might have been insane at the time, but he just wanted to make a space cowboy movie, right? Yes. Is that, that's what the original one seemed like. And it wasn't a great space cowboy. I mean, he, no. could have take, he could have taken Support Your Local Sheriff, for example, <laughs> the James Garner classic uh, that looked, by the way, I've recently seen it, and I saw it, uh, the DVD. I had always assumed that they had cut it for television, uh, but, horribly. No, 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 no. no. Someone <laughs> with a hacksaw it was just like smash cut, smash cut. We're just gonna, and now they're kissing, but they're not kissing. We're gonna punch somebody. And so, but support your local sheriff is not a good comedic western at all, but yeah. it's sort of like he took that and put it in space, and it was, it was great. Yes. Because of the, 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 the parts of it that you're like, well, I wanna like the good guy, and he is a good guy, and there's good fighting, and there's, there's, there's all this weird drama and, and yeah. it all looked so cool. So yeah, I, think I still the, want a land speeder. And <laughs> who I, doesn't? Who doesn't? I just drove in the rain in Los Angeles. I would have loved a land almost, speeder. Almost like a land speeder with the hydroplaning. <laughs> it was. I was yeah. trying to hydroplane to go it's faster. It's been raining for almost, it's two and a half days here. Very exciting. I'm sure there are many, many, many buildings that are sliding into the sea. <laughs> oh, yes. But uh, the rest of us who live in a valley are perfectly psyched. <laughs> um, yeah. So, okay. So in the Phantom, so what, what were your favorite scenes in Phantom Menace? Uh, Phantom Menace the lightsaber battle 
feels like it was directed by someone else. Okay. Uh, not only the actual lightsaber battle because with it's Darth cool, Maul, with or? Darth Maul, yeah. I fucking love Darth Maul. Darth Maul is great. I wanted Darth Maul. I wanted more Darth Maul. I wanted Darth Maul not to die. Yes. I wanted Darth Maul to be the bad guy. Yeah. Instead of we saw almost everything of him in the trailers, which was disappointing. Yeah. But Darth Maul is in the uh, Clone Wars animated series, oh, which it? I'm watching now, which is also one of the things. It's on Netflix. Okay. It's also one of the things that's making me like the prequels more. Because it is, Lucas's hand is still in it. Uh, he's coming up with like general story ideas. Okay. But then everybody else is executing them. Which so is, it's like which the prequels. The it's the best of the prequels because the visuals <laughs> right. are really good. Yeah. The voice actors are great. Mm-hmm. Uh, and Darth Maul comes back and you get the actual Darth Maul that you wanted in Phantom Menace. That was, uh, you're right. That is my favorite scene in, in Phantom Menace is when he finally fights in that weird, just flat plane with his double sided. Yeah. Bob and, uh, Lightsaber. <laughs> Dealy Bob. That's what they're called. That's the brand name. Some people call them Kleenex. I yeah. call them Dealy Bob. Disney's changing the names of some things. We're not it's, happy with that. Lightsaber is, it's, it's more like calling it a tissue. Uh, what I'm saying is Dealy Bob, the corporation made, so, yeah, so that was a great scene. Yeah. And, and it was not the actual lightsaber fight. The lightsaber fight is amazing, but also the little beats leading up to it, uh, they get separated by the weird, uh, force field. Qui Gon and right. Darth Maul when they're fighting get separated, and Darth Maul is like pacing and whacking the shield with his lightsaber to kind of taunt Qui Gon. Yeah, and Qui Gon just goes down and is sort of like Jedi repose. Yeah, and I love those moments of like you just get a glimpse of like, oh well, Yoda talks all this bullshit about peace and defense, right? And, like, and here's a moment where you get to see it where Qui Gon knows he's fighting for his life yes. against this Sith Lord that nobody's seen for thousands of years. Yeah, and he's just like. I'm just going to take a knee, <laughs> deep breath, exactly, exactly. just be at peace, and whatever happens, happens, and it'll be cool. Right, because Darth Maul is, is, is in that rage where it's just like it's animal rage. You know? Yeah. And, uh, and you can, yeah, you can totally see that. That yeah. is a great scene. And it's also one of my favorite things just for the George Lucas sort of insanity where when people didn't like it, he kept saying, well, it's a children's movie, is what he would say back in 99. Right. <laughs> yes, it's a children's movie. Where a guy who looks like Satan stabs a guy who looks like Jesus Christ. <laughs> Touche. <laughs> yes. Because <laughs> that is exactly what that is. And you're like, well, why is that okay, George Lucas, for the children's? Yeah. And it doesn't matter how many tiny robots you put in or how many squishy. Yeah, cute little things. Yeah, yeah, cute little side things and a thousand different pictures. Is there anything else you loved about the Phantom no, Menace? That, that was the best scene in Phantom Menace. Fair enough. Yeah. And what about clones? Uh, Clone War. Uh, the Attack of the Clones, uh, I like uh, some of the time that we spend with Obi-Wan. His hair is unfortunate. He has a, pretty much a straight-up mullet. Right. Which is really sad and unfortunate. But maybe he was just bringing it back himself. He's like, <laughs> maybe this will be something. No, he's... <laughs> The mullet hair is then given to Anakin. It's like passed down to him in the third movie. And there's like some behind the scenes <laughs> thing where Ewan McGregor's like, congratulations, you get it now. Like right. mullet is a space right. disease that gets passed from Jedi to Jedi. <laughs> right. It's until you deal with your rage. Yes. And, uh, uh, I also liked uh, the be- seeing the beginnings uh, of Anakin being evil. He finds out that the, the sand people have tortured and murdered his mother. Oh, right. And he, the moments right, where he, he goes loses- crazy is really effective. Uh, in because the, they're sort of foreshadowy. About. Yeah. So again, that's sort of like, well, anybody who had a lightsaber can kind of relate to like, oh, your your mom was murdered. Yep. And you suddenly have the power to just slaughter right. all of these people. Right. Uh, yeah. And there's great. Uh, the music is great. You see him thinking about it. Yeah. And the lightsaber comes out and there's almost like little psycho. There's almost like a little psycho music like. <laughs> Oh, like really? crazy psycho strings. I vaguely remember and that, yeah. Every time I get really mad, I hear that little passage of music <laughs> from that movie. <laughs> well, I like that you've brought it into your own life. <laughs> I have. That's part of it is these little things stick with me. Yeah. Uh, there's a line in Phantom Menace uh, where Palpatine, or Darth Sidious, is uh, his, his evil version, is talking to the Nemodians about his plan, and they ask in their horrible fake Japanese accents right. if this thing is legal. Mm-hmm. And he says, I will make it legal. Yeah, right. <laughs> I just, that line sticks with me. Also, when I'm mad, I'm just like, it doesn't matter. I can make a left turn here. I will make it legal. Finally, this is the defense that we have been looking for here at the Dark Forest of the first three movies. Let me just say that out loud and make make it yours, Joseph Scrimshaw. Yay. So, um, yeah, 
I remember that scene when he kills, and I was just like, this is why I didn't want to see this movie, is because <laughs> to watch a little boy who is adorable turn into an evil person, yeah. I was like, why don't I watch 12 Years a Slave? <laughs> and like, Not many lightsabers in that movie. Not as many lightsabers in that Mm-mm. movie. But here's the good news about the, the following three. We're back, we'll, we'll be back on the side of light. Yes. Hopefully. Yes. Uh, even though everyone always falls in love with the villain anyway. Yes. So for some reason. What other good scenes in Clones? Or was that the big one? That was really the big one. There are other yeah. elements. I, I like the whole... Wasn't there uh, a huge factory scene in Clones? Yes. That was... People say a lot that, that films have turned into video game sequences. And that one did feel like a video game sequence. Okay. And that was annoying. Uh, well, the end of Clones is the first time you see many, many Jedi together. Right. All fighting. And that was really cool. That, I wanted that to go on a little longer. Okay. So, uh, you know, I don't even remember that battle scene. The last scene I remember seeing, I think, was <laughs> the factory scene. And I was like, oh, I don't need to see any more of this. But now, now I wish to go back yeah. and see the good, at the very least. Could you just please cut together all the good scenes and then send that to me? That'd yeah. That would be awesome. Yeah, I think Topher Grace did that. but he Oh, did he? He okay. did to prove that he can edit movies, but it's okay. not released, which is sad. That is sad. But, uh, and now how about Revenge of the Sith, the best of the three? Oh. Was there more than one good scene in that one? Yes, I think uh, some of Obi Wan's uh, scenes. I think almost all of Obi Wan's scenes are great. Uh, okay, there is the really nice scene of him fighting General Grievous. A lot of people don't like that scene, no. but uh, I feel like tell me what it was since I have not yet seen <laughs> uh, the two thousand four. It is a plot point that in in order to end the Clone Wars, General Grievous must be captured. General okay. Grievous is a big robot guy who has a hacking cough. Okay. <laughs> He's half robot, half organic. His arms split into four. He can crawl around and he can uh, he can use four lightsabers at once. Okay. He's killed a bunch of Jedi. Uh, and Anakin wants to go because Anakin thinks he's the best Jedi. He's cocky and sure. angry and that. And they send Obi-Wan. And mm-hmm. Obi-Wan is kind of like, well, whatever. I do whatever. Yeah. Uh, and it's more in the novelization, but it's there in the, okay. in the movie. The idea that... Uh, Again, of kind of what a Jedi can be. Obi-Wan is very calm and very much about defense. And right. everybody else who's fought General Grievous has tried to, like, outpower him. Oh, and He's okay. got four arms and he's a half robot. <laughs> You're not going to overpower him. <laughs> and Obi-Wan's right. just more like, uh, I think I'll be defensive yeah. about this and cut off this. Uh, I cut think Ewan McGregor arms. is great. And it, he just captures sort of like when I imagined what a fully trained Jedi would be like. Okay. Like, of, again, that sort of acceptance of, like, I am confident in my abilities. Yep. But, but I whatever not... will happen will happen. Yeah. And okay. I'm just going to be steadfast and straight down the line. And it's just a kind of, like, a kind of heroics that I like to see. Yeah, that is awesome. And All I'll right. admit, I'm investing a lot of my own thoughts and some from the novelization. <laughs> into, into whether or scene. not. Into but that scene. When I watch the scene, these, that's what I think about, and that's why I enjoy it. And I will now definitely, because that, that makes me want to like it more. <laughs> and I and I love that world. So why why not take the positive of you've clearly read the novelization. Uh, oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and you've clearly been like, no, there's a lot of backstory that you don't understand that is brought into this. Yeah. George Lucas didn't write the novelization, right? I mean, no, just some, no. just some, some scribe sitting in a cube somewhere. They're like, <laughs> you're in charge of writing the novelization of the movie. Yeah. I mean, some pretty big name authors in the world of, of you know sci-fi okay uh terry brooks wrote the uh, wrote the book for phantom menace really i'm 99 sure i might have fucked that up and right many millions of people will tell us right, right. That up. we will be uh, we, will, <laughs> we will be alerted <laughs> the, uh, jackie at jackie but and, I, I mean i think i think the bottom line with lucas is i think he does have good ideas and right i think he had a lot of people who helped make them really good yeah in the first three movies yeah and those helpers just weren't there well, because he didn't need them. He didn't, because at that point, you know, you when you have too much power, you uh, abuse it. Right. I mean, when I look at the last three Harry Potter books, all mm. I can think is no editing, none. Yep. Nobody, you just wanted to go camping for three months and make <laughs> us live through it all. Please stop talking, J.K. Rowling. I love you dearly. Yeah. And so, but yeah, I mean, I think that there's just that power situation, which is why being sold to, you know, to Disney should help. Yes. And I and I just hope it's not going to overcorrect where we're oh, going right. to lose that sort of kernel of this is a weird universe and it is something that just made sense to this weird guy. And a, yeah. and a lot of the people one weird guy who had this make it work. Sort of solidified all of his good. sort cuz he was half half zen master and half kind of tool bag. 
You yeah. know? I mean, if, if you look at like, <laughs> if you look at like American Graffiti, yeah. there is, there are scenes in that you're like, that actually isn't okay, George. Uh, cause it's American, I think it's American Graffiti. Am yeah. I right? Okay. And thank God he hasn't gone back and, uh, d- done any <laughs> editing. That. Yes. And, uh, but the, there's, there's just scenes where you're like, oh, so you come from a, from a very sexist age where you're, things are okay to manipulate. You know, you're, it's okay to lie. It's okay. Right. So when he goes into Star Wars from American Graffiti, for me, and I didn't see anything else, he's only done a couple of other films, right? He's yeah. Maybe mm-hmm. one. THX 1138. That's it. Yeah. And, uh, two. That's right. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, but I just, I felt like, like if, when, when you watch that, Versus watching Star Wars, clearly some people were like, "Oh, that's a great idea. We're gonna make this into a cowboy movie. We're gonna make this into a into a Buck Rogers kind of thing. We're gonna take these ideas and make your hero more heroic, and you're gonna make and you know Luke Skywalker arguably very whiny according to the and when when I watch it, it has been it has been drummed into me that it's too whiny, and I'm like. Why would you want to ruin that? Yeah, and, uh, it's beautifully whiny. It's beautifully whiny because he. It's his journey. It's his journey. His journey. He gets to be whiny and then figure out how not to be whiny. By because by the third movie in the in the in the the f- number four, five, and six, he isn't whiny. Yeah. By the end of it, he is confident and peaceful. Yeah, and, I think Mark Hamill is massively underrated uh, because George Lucas doesn't give a lot of direction, and he took it upon himself to make these choices. Yep, is a young actor in the middle of the Tunisian desert, basically <laughs> alone. With broken down fake robots. Right. And he thought, how am I going to make this work? How am I going to be this character who goes on a journey? Right. How, how are we going to resonate with George this Lucas was off tinkering with the moisture evaporator <laughs> right. to make sure the bolt looked right. <laughs> right. And Mark Hamill was making those actual acting decisions yeah. as a young actor yeah. without any idea yeah. that every line reading will be memorized Right. And quoted back to him 40 for, years later. <laughs> for a million gajillion yeah. years. I yeah. think Mark Hamill did an amazing job with all all throughout the movies. Yeah, I, uh, I, I, I agree. I completely agree. <laughs> well, we are dorking out hardcore about <laughs> Star Wars, ladies and gentlemen. Thank God. It's finally come. Yeah. So what else in Revenge of the Sith did you love? Uh, I was disappointed. This isn't a good answer. I was, I was uh, disappointed in the final lightsaber battle. I okay. wanted it. It was really long, but it got like a little bit too flashy. So I like it when you can kind of see the moves, like why are they doing it? And, oh, okay. and, it, oh. and it, it just got a little overdone. Oh, just too many smash cuts to... Too to... fast of, in the edit. In the edit. Yeah. Okay. Because then you're not seeing the acrobatics. You're not seeing the things. Yeah. Sort of like with uh, professional wrestling. You want to see them do the backflip. Exactly. And then do the thing. You don't want to like, cut away. Don't yeah. cut away. And <laughs> the, the cool gymnastics that I cannot do. <laughs> I want you get a, some stand in to do that if the guy can't do it. Yeah. And, and they didn't do that. No, no. Okay. But, but I, I feel like the, the end scene, uh, again, in that sort of it's both bad and good at the same time, at, at the end. Right. After Obi-Wan has the high ground, he's he's leapt off this thing that's floating through the lava. Okay. And we're <laughs> other people get mad about this. We're introduced to a, a new law of Jedi fighting that if you're you have the high ground, you have the advantage. Fair uh, enough. Okay. Anakin thinks he's all powerful, doesn't listen. Yeah. He you know, he jumps in in a couple swishes, Obi Wan cuts his arms and legs off. Oh my god. Uh and now he is a doorstop. Yes. Until he is uh reconstituted yes and then this is kind of a bad moment but enjoyable obi-wan has uh ewan mcgregor has a great acting moment of feeling truly betrayed of like you were supposed to bring balance to the force not destroy it it's, yeah. yeah it's really powerful uh and then lucas clearly just remembers like oh yeah obi-wan needs to get anakin's lightsaber because oh. he, as we all know he gives it to luke and said your father right, we have a continuity issue please stop thinking yeah yeah so uh so he kind of yells it's emotional, and then it's kind of like an afterthought. He just picks up the lightsaber while Anakin is screaming, I hate you, I hate you, and then bursts <laughs> into flames. So then, <laughs> when you're listening to Obi-Wan in A New Hope saying to Luke Skywalker, your father wanted you to have this when you're old enough, <laughs> that's what I think the subtext of, I hate you, I hate you, ah! That's really the subtext. I feel... <laughs> I think we all feel that. We feel as, if, as your father was screaming in agony. Uh, but I know he would have wanted you to have this. <laughs> oh, my God. It's got to go somewhere, this lightsaber. Hysterical. Um, right. So those are the first three. What's interesting, today on the news, 
uh, with a Z. Actually, it's from <laughs> BBC, so it might not be news with a Z. It might be actual news. Uh, Richard the <laughs> Third, <III, laughs> Richard the Third's body was discovered, of course, at a carport. His bones—they're all in carports, right? Because they've—we turns out we've built some uh, some parking lots over <laughs> some bones. Uh, the entire United States is over the Native American bones that are scattered <laughs> around. But um, they did a DNA check today, and it was revealed that. Uh, that <laughs> surprise reveal, by the way, <laughs> that there might have been some infidelity in the royal lineage. No. Shock. Not surprised. <laughs> Not surprised. <laughs> Turns out everybody, uh, I don't know why. Uh, there's enough people who are not powerful cheating on their spouses. When <laughs> when when people get super powerful, <laughs> yeah, uh, it's almost a gimme. I thought JFK invented it. No, yeah, yeah, that exactly. He was the first 19- was like, hey, wait a minute. You mean I could probably have sex with anyone? <laughs> yes, JFK. You're a relatively normal looking adult male, <laughs> and with the most power in the world. You are the least ugly president ever. <laughs> So far, the least, least ugly, ugly president ever. <laughs> right. You could probably get some action off of that. Anything? <laughs> and uh, yeah, so I guess uh, Richard, the, there might have been some Tanner the Seventh, Edward the Second, whatever. Who cares? Uh, but where they figured it out was the DNA strand from the mother, which are called mitochond- mitochondria. Mitochondria? Yeah, they're called mitochondrial. Oh, so very George close to Lucas, midichlorians. Very close to midichlorians. And, uh, of course, vindicating George Lucas. <laughs> and because it's British, let's uh, let's go with Indian food. He is now Vindaloo. He is, uh, <laughs> that is a vindication, but Indian food version. <laughs> of, Vindaloo-cation. Uh, <laughs> Vindaloo. <laughs> when you're right about Indian food. <laughs> when you are right about Indian food. Let me tell you about the clay pot down Sherman Oaks. Uh, it's a real nice Indian restaurant. Anyway, so... Uh, <laughs> But uh, yeah, so that is uh, that's bringing it to the current the 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 first release of the Star Wars trailer was yes. sent out. I uh, didn't listen to it; I just watched <laughs> it. I can't, but I did see. So you watched it without audio? Yes. Do you hate sound? Why did you do that? I did it because, uh, well, first of all, I was in a group. Okay. And they were having a conversation, and I just wanted to see it. <laughs> you didn't and... just scream, shut up, shut up. I'm <laughs> going to watch Star Wars. I'm going to watch Star Wars right now. Everyone should shush. And what's weird is is it's been two days now, and I haven't watched it again. Uh, or I did watch it again, but again without the sound for some reason. And then I watched the one that's it's called the George Lucas. Yes. Uh, trailer the special edition the special edition which is clearly not by george lucas but as a mockery of uh, mr lucas yes. because there are adorable and weird uh choices uh with props and cgi <laughs> behind every single clip that they've shown in this yeah it's thing. pretty spot on it seemed to nail it uh but <laughs> i thought it looked really cool yeah but we don't know what they're gonna do with the talking how was well, the you talking? really don't know. I have no idea what they're going to do with the talking. Uh, people bitched about the talking. Okay. And I, and I disagree with their bitchery on this. Okay. Uh, because it is, this was, this was their complaint. It seems kind of melodramatic, maybe a little bit cheesy. Like, <laughs> oh, the I'm film sorry. is called Star Wars. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. What part of this is going to be a Star Wars movie did you miss? Yeah. Cheesy and melodramatic are the two words that define every single episode and it is it's artfully cheesy and melodramatic because it's beautifully it, it's hinting at something the actual it's a it's a voiceover um i, I guess it was andy circus who did it Somebody okay has dug up that this is uh <laughs> the truth that andy circus did it uh and Alum? it is pretty much like if you just like set a computer to auto-generate can you mix up some cool Star Wars words so they sound like they're saying something? <laughs> okay. That's basically what it is. Like, right, because there's nothing. At a time, there was an awakening and then some light, but also okay. dark. Right. But don't forget <laughs> light. I mean, that's about what the trailer is. Wait, I, th- I believe there. Andy Ashcraft explained that to me. Uh, he said, yeah, there was just like, there's been an awakening, there's going to be light, but there's also going to be darkness. So yeah. I was like, oh, then I don't have. That's why I didn't listen and to it. Maybe I was like, some medium beige. Like, <laughs> Right. There might be some regular people who become. <laughs> cannon fodder in the middle of it all some fuchsia yeah uh yeah so i mean there's almost nothing to it but artfully so because it just it, because it makes it evokes that sort of like oh this is going to be about the force right. it's not going to be about trade disputes okay and, <laughs> and something new about the force and a conflict between like new bad guys and okay. familiar good guys I mean, okay it's, it's very it's on the money for like manipulating yeah yeah what people want yeah so well, which is a classic Disney 
uh, they, they, they tend to, I mean, if they don't hit the nail right on the head, they hit it hard enough <laughs> that it will go into the wood yes. and, uh, and everyone leaves vaguely disappointed. They uh, nuke the nail on the head. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> You're just like, ah, oh, big hero six. I wanted to like you even more, but almost, yeah. uh, it was, it was damn good. I liked, uh, I did enjoy. Uh, I big haven't hero seen six. big hero six. Uh, did you see frozen? Yes. Frozen made me want to cut myself <laughs> with ice. Uh, but uh, only because I kept, all I could think was terrible parenting. Uh, yeah. One terrible parenting. And then weird bad guys, like the charming jackass. Yeah. That was weird for that me. That seemed almost more like a dating PSA. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, don't just get right into it, ladies. Yeah, don't yeah. Just, yeah. Don't, don't rush into it. Don't yeah. rush into everything. Listen, get your sister's feedback first. <laughs> Right, even if you don't, you and your sister don't talk very well. Ask your she's got some distance. She's got a little bit of distance. Snowman friend. Right. Yeah. I know he's very handsome, and you might want to kiss his face, but that's not going to be enough. In the probably end. a douchebag. Yeah, he might be a run douche a douchebag test. <laughs> right, run that uh, by the. Okay, so uh, wh- when are they coming out? The, the the first of the new. The first of the new one is December uh, two two thousand fifteen. So just about okay. a year. Okay. Um, people lost their minds about the lightsaber. And oh right. The lightsaber bothered me too. The I Excalibur. About it, but it, yeah, yeah, it did bother me. Because of the hilt, it looked weird, and then I was like, whatever. As long as it didn't have two, and yeah. then two, <laughs> was, like like the George Lucas uh, one. People all talked about sort of the practical aspects of, you know, how does a sword work? And, uh, you know, the entire world mansplained why you would have that kind of guard and blah, blah, blah. And I don't care about any of that. It feels right. to me, it frightened me because it feels, again, manufactured. It right. feels like they wanted to say, like, hey, remember in the Phantom Menace trailer when Darth Maul had the double-bladed lightsaber. Yeah. And it was like, oh, my God, and it was so cool. So it felt like they wanted something that made people go, oh, my God. It felt a little manipulative. Yeah, but it made people go, uh, actually, and start explaining how swords work. <laughs> well, what so I, I th- feel like it missed the beat. Did you see it Colbert last night? Yes. Because he did explain how that would work, as if <laughs> if the plasma beam was connected on at, at, the, at, the, at, the, at, the, at the cross point. Yeah. point then it would not just cut through and he and it used would be a, right. he used a tweet from my good friend bill corbett oh was that who that was yeah in that, okay in, in it was I, totally I tried a joke to find, of course it and was I, I mean i think i think colbert knew that yes uh, and i hope people interpreted it that way it was the best it was the best tweet it, it was, was something hilarious a, something about ruining my childhood <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> ruined, ruined, ruined. ruined swords ruined my childhood <laughs> Run, run. Exclamation point yes. one! Exclamation point one! All right, yeah. so follow at Bill Corbett. Um, <laughs> you could also follow at jo- uh, Joseph Scrimshaw. Yeah, and, or uh, both, or both. What the heck? You've you've Go got crazy. that kind of technology. <laughs> you can unfollow eventually. <laughs> <laughs> it's the whole thing with Twitter, and, uh, and nobody notices. But um, unless you do that, friend or unfollow or friend I or un- don't I never do because I can't. Yeah. I can't care. Every just, once in a while, I accidentally notice if someone has unfollowed me. Yeah. And then you have to do that modern, weird psychological dance of why? Why would you have? Which tweet was it? What did? <laughs> what, what, what sent you sailing? Yeah. I'm being followed right now by a guy who keeps uh, talking to not just me, but to a bunch of people. And he's just, he's left his, uh, his thing, an egg. Really? And he doesn't have any sort of, um, like there, there's no intro. It doesn't say who it is. Okay. And sometimes it's weirdly sexual. Yeah. So I'm uncomfortable even favoriting any of his. I'm just like, just well, tell me who you are and we can have a convert. I mean, I'm a t- the attainable goal to talk so to Jackie Cation. I think most people feel on Twitter, sexual comments from an egg is an auto <laughs> auto block. It should be. An, it, it felt so now, You it seem felt like you're being very generous to accept sexual auto- comments from an egg. <laughs> right. It was... <laughs> <laughs> they're 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 sort of right on that line of right before blockage. Yeah. And I don't I don't I think he's just awkward or he's trying to be funny. Yeah. And I don't even know if it's a he, right? Because obviously I've been not given enough information. It's an egg. <laughs> uh, it literally could be an elder it could be Betty White. I don't know. <laughs> How funny would it be if it were Betty White? It is very optimistic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that is the most optimistic. B. Arthur's come back <laughs> and uh, to talk to me about things. Uh I do want to talk. Um we we've we've used most of the Star Wars, but we Excellent. could just we could just talk more Star Wars. We can just or, keep going Star Wars if you want. It's a, I, but I, do I don't it. have any more questions. No. <laughs> That's my biggest thing. Is is uh, you, you've really you've summed it up and you've made me want to watch the prequels Excellent. at least on fast forward. Yes, and uh, feel free to fast forward through some scenes and yeah. acknowledge, man, this is bad. Man, this is bad. Things, but it will seep in. It will seep in because <laughs> you'll get to see the cool scenery and the cool CGI. Yeah, it does look. It looks like everything I want it to look like. You know, yeah. and. It's why I enjoyed Firefly so much, because it felt like it wasn't being written by a madman. 
<laughs> right? It was written by a smart man, which is written, weird. Which was weird and awesome. Just yeah. someone with with empathy and and um and humor and a sense of adventure and a sense of all of those yeah. things. Not to blow too much smoke up Joss Whedon's ass. Firefly that... is pretty amazing. Like it... I get, I, I get tired of people not wanting to let it go because I thought it resolved. But I think right. it is pretty amazing. I mean, to have, have a show be that good out of the gate, right, is amazing. Right. It was, it was when he, when, when, when the captain in Firefly kicks that mercenary into the engine. Yes. I was like, oh, I am in. Yeah. I am on board with whatever happens on this program. Yeah. 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 And the pilot when he he shoots the guy in the head uh, without. Pausing well, that, as he's, he's walking like, and going about walking, his business. Yes, you're just like, like okay, you are a, a superpower. You have a superpower. Yeah, yeah. It captured everything that was cool about Han Solo. Yes. And and it put it in this new context. And, yeah. yeah. And it really summed I mean, I was thinking about how uh, super superheroes in general and how... Because uh, I, I... One of my... I was asked what my, who my favorite superhero when I was a kid was. And uh, and I, I couldn't think of one. And I asked, really? well, I asked Andy Ashcraft, uh, I said, <laughs> would Tarzan count? And he said, yeah, yes, Tarzan clearly a superhero. Yeah. Because Tarzan has superpowers. He can talk to animals. He can, <laughs> he can swing from trees where yes. there's little or no. He can yodel. He can call animals with yeah. his yodel. He can, he can wrestle alligators or crocodiles or whatever the large reptile that lives in that part of, uh, that, that. That's really up for wrestling. That's up for wrestling. He can, <laughs> All the time. For some reason, he can find Indian elephants on the African continent, <laughs> and uh, but and then and then he you know he finds a lady, and then <laughs> that is he is clearly a superhero. So he was my favorite superhero as a child um, because I love Tarzan. Tarzan was the greatest. Did you watch the old movies? The yeah, Johnny the, Weissmuller? Yeah, right? Johnny Weissmuller and the other ones. I I for the longest time I couldn't tell the difference between any of them. I was like, what a tall white guy. All right. <laughs> One swims more than the other, but, uh, <laughs> and he clearly learns how to speak English better when Jane hangs out with yep. him and then they adopt boy. Uh, cause they have to adopt for boy. For God, it was just boy. Yeah. They adopt boy because, uh, Hayes code, right? Pre, uh, it was Hayes code. So they couldn't, have because they hadn't uh, had a ceremony to marry, right? So they weren't allowed to have sex on screen, uh, or to even acknowledge that they could have possibly ever had sex, even though they they cohabitate, and uh, they have boy because they found boy, and uh, <laughs> luckily, <laughs> and I so wanted to be boy. Who was your favorite superhero as a child? Uh, as a kid, it was uh, Robin, and then Nightwing. Oh, interesting! You oh, you followed Robin's career. Oh yes, what you did. Oh yes, <laughs> I have the the actual issue where he becomes Nightwing. Okay, uh, who he, wrote that? Uh, Marv Wolfman. Oh, oh, thank you. With artwork by who I've met, and and I did a sketch about him in front of him at Convergence Science and, Fiction Convention. And did that blow your mind? Yes, kind yes. of. Yeah, uh, yes. I, I've met and and I'm lucky enough to be friends with lots of cool, famous people. But Marv Wolfman is probably the first person I kind of geeked out. Right, and to, you were psyched. And I did the really stupid thing of, do you remember that line from the Teen Titans? And he's like, no, I <laughs> no, don't sadly. at all. Sounds good, though. I'm glad I wrote it. <laughs> exactly. He's like, I've written a, th a bajillion lines since yes. then, and yes. it's hard to, but uh, I'm glad you enjoyed it. But I loved Robin uh, because uh, I have a brother. He's three years older than me. Okay. And we, we divided everything up. We had like, it was like we were getting divorced. <laughs> we we div divided up properties. Okay. So he liked Han, and I liked Luke. Okay. Uh, and I liked Kirk, and he liked Spock. Okay. And he picked Batman and sort of said, you can have Robin. Uh, <laughs> but I related to Robin, who was right. just as competent as Batman, but Batman didn't believe it. Right. Uh, and then he totally comes into his own as Nightwing. Right, because you have to. You Eventually, you have to leave Batman. We yes. all have a Batman inside of us. I was thinking about this this morning, which is a weird thing to wake up to thinking, is that we all have a Batman hmm. inside of us. Our inner Batman. Our inner Batman, that we then have to grow up and get over our parents' death and uh, and have a life. Yeah, right. and move on. And I was on. thinking about Batman earlier today, too. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> I think about Batman a lot. Sure. Uh, yeah. I was just thinking about why people like him so much, and I think it is because he's kind of crazy, but he also has his shit together. Yeah. Like, you can rely you on mean? Batman. Oh, yeah? Like, Bat whenever Batman's in a story with other superheroes, he's the one who holds it together. Right. He's, he's the fair. one who has a plan B. He's the one 
He's got a great administrative side. Like, if a bunch of superheroes went to, like, Disneyland together, right. Batman would be the one who was like, we need to get in this line now. Right. You guys I wanna... bought the passes ahead of time. <laughs> right. What are those those fast passes? He's yeah. like, what we're going to do is we're going to get fast passes for Indiana <laughs> Jones. Then we're going to come back. What that means is that we'll get to ride two or three rides ahead of what you think is going to happen. Yeah. We're not just going to stand in line for this. So, yeah. So he's got this side of him oh, that's, that's, like, awesome. totally got his everything together <laughs> right but he's also but we know his inner demons so we know right. he's a mess and he can't really relate to people and right right which is interesting because when i think about the batman show from the 60s yeah which i've seen you know and and i haven't seen in years but uh i i could probably name four or five of them right or yeah. uh, please do not please do not quiz <laughs> me and uh but you're gonna go with egghead aren't I'm, you <laughs> i'm gonna go with the penguin and uh but the but i think about his like what he was like in those ones and he was very much a dad yeah. he was sort of like the dad in leave it to beaver but is as as like a but as a superhero where he was just like well clearly I can outpunch anyone and then I have all these toys so that we can get away and we can go, we can move quicker and these yeah. types of things but it was it was a very basic kind of superhero I like that I like where it, it, it even though it was absurd it felt more human yeah his superpower is just sort of I'm an adult. <laughs> Yes! <laughs> Grow up, everyone. <laughs> exactly. Please. And it felt very much like I'm an adult. I'm going to use my powers for good. My powers are not that exceptional because they are money-based. <laughs> and But they are real powers yeah, because it... we all have real money-based powers. <laughs> not as much as Bruce Wayne. But, no, uh, but to I varying wish. degrees, yeah. we have money-based powers and adult-based powers. And those are the two powers. That's exactly what I have. <laughs> that is exactly what it is. And I fucking love that. Yes. Uh, awesome. All right. Yeah. And so and I liked Robin because he's striving to be an adult. Right. And, you know, and so so is I. Right. Because that that's the whole that that's why I think we're all drawn to teenage superheroes and teenage like even the chosen. I mean, but every, <laughs> even like every every coming of age story, you know, the Earthsea trilogy, you can you can um, you can. We all want to hear about that. You know, somebody's 13 and then they're a, they're a mess and then they sort of come to their own and then they and they have these battles. Yeah. And it reminds you of your journey, I think, right. of how you got to where you are and how you could do better in the eyes of your teen yeah. self yes. as an adult. Right. Right. And it's and, you know, they're more internal battles as a as a walking around <laughs> human in this universe. Yes. But uh, you get to see a manifestation of those as because I love all teenage superheroes. <laughs> I am on board with Runaways, with uh, uh, Young Avengers. Yeah. Did you collect New Mutants? New Mutants. I yep. love New Mutants. New Mutants is great. Yep. And um, so what you were, we all have. Ah, <laughs> uh, and then the phone rang. <laughs> Explain what the hell comic theory is while I hang up on somebody. Oh, okay. Uh, I, uh, Jackie asked for obsessions and i gave her star wars prequels obviously uh and i also uh talked about uh comic theory i love talking about how comedy actually works and functions and lots of comedians uh are annoyed <laughs> by that oh. uh but i i really like uh, i took a class basically when i was in college and it was oh, like the i took several classes uh but it was the one that stuck with me and made it worth spending $30,000 on a degree. Wow, just the uh, one class stuck with you. Yes. That is unfortunate. The, well, uh, a couple others. There we go. No, I took two on comic theory uh, and a lot on rhetoric and, and just basically how do we get ideas across and how do we communicate okay. on this sort of higher level. And yeah, the But humor-based. Yeah, the comic theory stuff was about not only is how comedy works and why it works. So like the main points being sort of that all comedy comes from contrast. Okay. Which oh right, the twist and the the twist in just putting two thing unexpected things together. Sure. Which unlikely friends, tortoise, <laughs> exactly. duck. <laughs> well, yeah, and you you test that by telling <laughs> kids like, well, what kind of sound does a duck make? Moo. Right, and, they and laugh the hilarity and their, ensues. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so it's it's this very I like it because it's this very simple primary concept of comedy comes from contrast. But the more you think about it, you start to think about. Well, if somebody says something funny without really a standard setup line, it's just the punchline, mm -hmm. then you know that there's some internal thing that all humans are agreeing on, that that punchline is reacting to a straight line that just exists in our culture. Okay. So when you start looking at that, so if you go to like a stand-up show and somebody makes like a really stereotypical kind of crappy 
joke yeah. about like how it's a drag to be married. Yep. And everybody laughs. Yep. Then you know, well, the people in this room have in their mind the straight line. That right. That is true. So this is a funny comic exaggeration of the truth. So you can shorthand it all the way to the end? Is yeah, what you're saying? I think so. I think that it's it's just fascinating to think about what what is if you accept the theory that there is always a contrast as simple or as direct as a duck goes moo. Right. It really gets you thinking about what's the unspoken half of this comic idea. Okay. Well, because, well, first of all, let me just say, when you said comic theory, I thought you were talking comic books, which is why I went into superhero <laughs> talk. But I think comedy, and we can talk about comedy for 15 minutes. I'm on board, be, my friend. Yeah, I would be happy to. Uh, it's a, it is seriously a dork. <laughs> I was trying to explain to somebody last night because this guy emailed me and he was like, hey, my, uh, my girlfriend's going to be there. Um, don't mention that you saw me with this other girl the other night. And I was like, what? First of all, that is terrifying uh, that I would be responsible for that. And second yeah. of all, um, I didn't recognize either one of those women <laughs> because and then I said, and I can try to explain it to you in a Dragon Riders of Pern kind of way. <laughs> But you would need to have read Dragon Riders of Burn in the last 20 years. Anyone? And I literally said to the audience, has anyone read the Dragon Riders of Burn in the last 20 years? Nope. Dead silence. Dead silence. <laughs> Comic did come up to me afterwards and say, I read it when I was 13. Now you make me want to read it again. What was the joke? And I just said, <laughs> the fact that I never remember any comedians, wives or husbands or boyfriends or girlfriends names. Beca and I remember the names of the comedians. And I remember their jokes. Uh, much like Falar only remembered uh, the names of the dragons <laughs> and not the riders. So uh, it's a long way to go, a long way to go. And, uh, and, but I will say this comic theory is fascinating to me because I always thought of it. I used to do this bit that I called nostalgic comedy. Okay. And I stopped doing it because I felt like I was cheating, hmm. you know, cause I always, um, I was trying to work with the idea because there, there, there's something here, but I just can't find a way to get into it that isn't nostalgic. Yeah. Is the fact that there is always a B plot in all movies. And the crummier the movie, the more glaringly obvious is the social <laughs> message underneath it. Okay. And sometimes it can be, it can be right wing. Sometimes it can be left wing. It doesn't really matter, but the message is there. And then I do, uh, then I do examples and the examples are where the comedy is right now. Okay. But that's not where I want the comedy to be. I want the comedy. I want there to be a punchline, not just remember, um, dirty dancing, the B plot of dirty dancing right. is keep abortion legal, right? That makes people smile like you just uh -huh. did and kind of laugh a little bit footloose. Censorship is bad, <laughs> right? See, and then, and if I can name 15 of them, I can build enough to create an actual audience laugh. But that's not what I want to do. You don't want to tell 15 well, warm-up jokes. Right, exactly. <laughs> and then the twist, of course, is Blue Crush, that surfer movie. Yeah. Because the, the B-plot of that was that true happiness is found through corporate sponsorship. That is, uh, that's the twist. That's the closest I've been able to come to a twist. Okay. But there's no punchline there. I always think of those kind of jokes as the joke hole. Where you have set up a concept and it's that's the what concept. I call my mouth. <laughs> anyway. The it's concept. the concept you're interested in. But you're only able to really deliver the laugh on the examples. Yeah. But it's really the concept you want to talk about. I, yeah. The as concept a, as a, is fascinating. As a comedian. And yeah. it's, it can be – like I think that's why people love Louis C.K. Because he's really great at just throwing out here's the, Huge, the concept. Big. Here's the big concept that I'm thinking about. And he doesn't massage it down into sort of like that, that drop-down menu of example jokes. Yeah, yeah. That is what gets the actual laugh. Right. But what I'm actually – Interested right. intellectually he wants to is. talk about the part of your brain that wants to, that accidentally thinks it's going to kill a baby if you're handed one. Yes. Right? I mean, he wants to discuss that theory, and he does. And there's, and there's usually a real punchline at the end of it. Yeah. And he doesn't get into a bunch of examples of, like, I don't even know if he's doing that, but I do think that is, I think that's a common trope. I think, I, I hope I, hope I'm not alone, you guys. That's why I need to be seated when I'm handed a baby under the age of three months. Uh, Cause I think I'm going to kill it. <laughs> so please, if you have a baby under three months. Yes. I really hope I haven't ever killed a baby without knowing. <laughs> well, Just out of my pure irresponsibility radiating out from me. Right. And the baby somewhere is like, ouch. Ouch. Why? Well, I know. I just, I think I'm going to drop it. I think yeah. whatever. But, uh, the, but yeah, but that, that's it exactly. And, and so what, so that's the, th the theory is, is that there has to be a twist and there has to be. Yeah. And I think, I think, it, it, 
I think I like thinking about the theory because it, it makes you question how to heighten. So if you say like, oh, people only see the contrast sharp enough when you say footloose. I know right. what footloose is about. It's not about that. Right. Ha ha ha. There's that sharp contrast. Yeah. Then it makes you think like, well, OK, if my basic concept is to they're not seeing where the contrast is. Right. They're not seeing the surprise or the shock or the seeing things from a different perspective. Right. Or, or I'm just uh, pointing out the, pers- the 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 difference instead of really creating it in in a sharp enough contrast to create. I guess the the next. I mean, in in a joke structure, yeah. what I would do, whether or not this would be, or uh, it, it feels also contrived. But you know, jo- jokes are not they're they're they're, they're not. They're not uncontrived. No, they, have they to are be, they have contrived. To be, yeah, they have to be written. <laughs> so what to say that there's a B plot and then I do Footloose and Dirty Dancing and, and, and Blue Crush, the next step, I guess, would be to come up with the ultimate contrast. Right. The ultimate is just like you think it's going to be a story about Hitler Youth and how horrible Hitler Youth is. But the B plot is, is we should all get rescue animals or whatever, <laughs> right? I mean, yeah. like something like that. Yeah. Or the, yeah, the thing that it just has no basis in reality and it's just a subversion. Right. Of y- Triumph of the Will is about how great Nazis are. <laughs> right. That's the subtle subtext that, of Triumph the of the subtle, Will. The subtle subtext. But then again, like uh, plenty of people would be Triumph of the what now? <laughs> yeah. Right. Well, yeah. Yeah. Uh, the other concept that I think about a lot is uh, uh, Sigmund. This is from Freud's book on on comedy. Uh, the concept of the joking envelope, which is just the, the sort joking of, envelope. The joking envelope. So the idea that there is a social agreement that needs to be made for comedy to happen. Yeah. Uh, in in a, I, I've done like workshops on this uh, where I get people to try it out. Okay. Uh, and the example I always give of like not in a performative kind of comedy, but in just being funny as a person, like. If you're in an office with kind of a typical office job, right, you can probably get away with saying to your boss, like, I heard you're not very good at golf, you know, if you're standing around the water cooler. Right. And that's funny because standing around in the water cooler, yeah. we're in the joking envelope. Yeah. But if you're in the middle of a business meeting and you were discussing like quarter three performance and you just raised your hand and said to your boss, I hear you're not very good at golf, <laughs> you're in so much fucking trouble. Right. Because you're not in the joking envelope. The envelope is, is, is sort of the place that the joke is accepted. Yes, it's where, a physical. It's a physical gathering that is not sort of work. Real, I mean, it's 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 outside. Yeah, I think it's it's a, it's a social agreement. And yeah. so it's, I think it's a subtle thing. Yeah. And I think about this a lot when I see stand up because I feel like you can it, in performing comedy like mm-hmm. stand up. It's you just can have to sense it. And I think like for a lot of like offensive humor. Oh, okay. Like if you're in, in a certain kind of club, people are in the joking envelope for. I really work nine to five. I'm kind of a, a straightforward person. I'm in the joking envelope for maybe mentioning a penis. Right. <laughs> I am not in the joking envelope for talking about murdering babies. R- right. Right. It de- like it depends who you like. I'm I'm opening. Uh, I've I've opened two or three times now for Brian Regan. Mm-hmm. When you go out, though, that envelope is very specific and. They're okay with dark, but they don't want to hear anything about bodily functions. They don't want to hear anything about sex, and they don't want to hear any curse words. Because Brian Regan naturally doesn't write about, doesn't do he those things. He doesn't write things. those things, yeah. Right, but he is very dark, and he is, you know, he there's sarcasm, there's there's twists, there's turns, the jokes are amazing. Yeah. But it's none of those three things. So if I have jokes that have those three things in them, now's the time. To not, uh, to not go to those places. Those places probably not going to be well received in front of three thousand giant Brian Regan fans, yeah. right? So, but if I'm opening for Chappelle or somebody, right? Yeah. If you're working in a in in that envelope, yeah, I think people are coming to that show saying, "I want to hear thoughts. I want to hear experiments." It's probably okay if there isn't a laugh for like. Although that's a minute while you're building to a complex and interesting idea, because that's that's Bamford's audience. Bamford's audience are like, bring me down a rabbit hole. Uh, I don't maybe yes. there might be something interesting at the end of it, hopefully a punchline. But I don't care if there is one. Yeah. And um, and, you know, with with Maria there, there there is. But. Um, but it is it is it is interesting what the envelopes that people create, like f- sort of famous people. When they go out and you work with them or you're in that, yeah. that that kind of environment. And I think about it in terms of Twitter, too, because you can't generate it on Twitter 
unless you spend a long time. Like I think Rob Delaney is one of the only people on Twitter who successfully built a joking envelope where you just knew culturally he is saying horrible things, but he's always joking. He's always, you know, that he's joking. Whereas if just some random comedian says something absolutely horrible with, without context and just gets retweeted into your feed, you don't have any of the framework you need to say, I'm in the mood for this joke. I am socially ready for this joke. Right. Then it's just You see horror. Rob Delaney's name and you're like, oh, it's probably going to be some disgusting <laughs> reference to bodily functions. Yeah, yeah. And, it's um, about shitting on a boner. And like, oh, but it's Rob Delaney. So it's right. fun shitting on a boner, <laughs> not horrific whole, exactly. shitting on a boner. <laughs> that boner <laughs> needed to be pooped upon and nobody knew it. Nobody knew it until Bob Del- Rob Delaney saw it. <laughs> and because <laughs> he created that envelope. That is interesting. Yeah. So that's an interesting there's so there's the twist there's the the envelope is there any other things that you got out of that class uh the 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 super weird one is the Henri Bergson who's a French philosopher okay who talked he thought all comedy came from the encrustation of the mechanical on the living versus Elan Vital well let's leave it at that <laughs> <It> sounds good <laughs> no i'm kidding what uh, is it? B- boiling down he thought a lot of comedy came from the contrast between the organic world and humans desire to make physical structures out of things. Okay. So basically any time where you want something to be flowing in natural, just sort of intrinsically, because we do as humans, we expect trees to bend and go right. at whatever angle. Mm-hmm. But then we've built a world that like buildings are straight. Yeah. The world doesn't make sense unless the table has edges. Right. Or it's round or it's an oval, but it's got to be a perfect oval. Right. And that there's just this natural schism that where that- we have, we sense that the world should be flowing in organic right. on some level of our lizard brains. Yes. But then we also have built this world where we've made all these rigid institutions where things should go a certain way. And like, the comedy occurs when those things get contrasted. Like oh, okay. I think that's why why people laugh a lot like when say a person falls and slips on the ice. Yep. You have that sort of organic idea of like of course that's just physics that's nature right. it's ice. Yeah. We've built this rigid structure where Humans are proud and stand tall and can walk. Nope. Nope. And you get you get the <laughs> reality so, of the organic thrown in your face. Oh, I see. And it's 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 a different kind of contrast or twist, but yeah. it's sort of trying to get at the root of why. Okay. And I think uh like autocorrect is also a great example. Oh of, I'm trying to say something <laughs> flowing and beautiful to my wife. Yes. And I said, you know, I'm gonna piss in the yogurt. You yeah. know, when I Wanted to say something lovely and beautiful and flowing, and but the, these machines are not at all organic, right? And we put all of this organic energy into them, and what comes out is this mechanized "fuck you." <laughs> <laughs> right, right, okay. Uh, Which is why autocorrect is funny against our very wills to some extent, because you're just like, well, no, it just happened. That's that shouldn't be yeah. that funny, but we all laugh at it anyway. Because into the point where like it's it's a hackneyed joke. A lot of people think we're like. Yeah. Don't talk about autocorrect, but it's still funny. It's still funny against that's it's yeah, yeah. There's and and it's what, now. What about this joke? What about this kind of joke <laughs> that uh, that that uh, my father and Andy Ashcraft and <laughs> what I think of as guy funny, where you drive past a, a a cow or a horse that's in a field, and every single time, someone will say. You see that cow? You know, that that's an amazing cow. And you're like, why is that cow amazing? It's like, well, it's outstanding in its field. <laughs> so, uh, A yeah. hundred times. And I will laugh at it a dozen times out of those hundred times. And the other 83 times, uh, my dad will, my, or Andy will just go, ha, not this time, next time. <laughs> and so they'll keep doing it. I see that is exactly what Bergson was talking about, of the encrustation of mechanical versus Elan Vital. In that okay. we sense a joke should be, a flowing organic surprise, a natural human thing. Right. And then when like a dad or a spouse <laughs> says belligerently, I'm going to make it into a robotic duty <laughs> and I'm going to say it again and again right. and I'm going to drive all humor out of it. Right. Then it's fun. When you drive all humor out of it, like when isn't a, a, a door a door? When it's a jar? Yeah. And this, <laughs> right. That's not funny. That should never be funny. It's just, and I'm not uh, laughing at it because it's funny. Right. I'm laughing at the idea that it would be funny. <laughs> right. Well, that's... that's <laughs> Right, which and, and is that the organic versus the mechanic? Is, I think so. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's where that comes from. Yeah. That 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 feels that feels that resonates yeah. a little bit. I, I think get these that. and these are like to me. What's interesting about it is these are root concepts, mm-hmm. and then as we get more and more sophisticated in our communication with one another, 
the actual mechanisms by which we see them change. Right. Like when people sense uh, a joke's construction, they turn against you. They will. They will. Un- unless you can telegraph it in a way that they feel smart about. Yes, it. which you are great at, by the way. Oh, thank you very you, much. Uh, yeah. It's you... uh, oh, wow. All right. So I'll take that. As a, <laughs> I, w- I will just say thank you. <laughs> and uh, yeah, because it's, it's, it is one of my favorite things to do because the audience is never dumb. No. I mean, most of them, right? <laughs> I mean, most of the audience, they have their brains and they can figure out. You're like, and you're They often to, know where they are. Right. They know where they are. They have... They, <laughs> They have all their <laughs> digits. It's all coming together. <laughs> so if you telegraph where you're going with it, and then they start to get this half smile, and then and then you do it, and you do it right, or if you do it and then you tag it with something that's even more absurd or or, or yes. even a, a, another left-hand turn, then then everyone is pleased. Yes. The person who has written that joke is, is psyched. Uh, the people <laughs> who have gotten it ahead of time are psyched. The people who didn't get it ahead of time are like, oh, cool. And Wait. then, ha! Even more, even better, because I'll tell you something. I'm the person who never fucking gets anything. I saw, uh, I see dead people. What's the name of the movie? Uh, Six Sense. Six Sense. Didn't get it. <laughs> Didn't get it until the fork huh. drops. Literally, the second shoe had to drop for me to go. Oh, he's a ghost. So the part where Bruce Willis turned to the camera and went, "I'm a fucking ghost." Yes. You were like, "Oh." I get it even more now. <laughs> now I get it, and I get it again, and then I'm psyched as, a, as I could possibly be to have gotten it. <laughs> Usual suspects. I uh, didn't see that movie in time, uh, so I was given the information before I went in to see the movie. Uh, someone had spoiled uh-huh. it, and but I was psyched that they spoiled it, kind of, because then I was like, "Huh, I see." <laughs> you got me spending the entire time like a child going, oh, I see what you said. Okay. And then they'd cut to the, and so that was to some, to some extent, like, I, and I'm not a dumb person, yeah. but I, there's, there's sometimes I just don't get shit. Yeah. Understandable. And, uh, that's the fun moment for me as a comedian. When you construct a joke thinking like some of the people will get it at this point. Right. And then for the rest, I'll have to keep driving or maybe even turn around and go back for them. <laughs> And there's right. these beautiful moments where, like, they all get it the first time. And yeah. I had some beautiful moments where you're just like, well, uh, I'm not going to tell the rest of the joke because right. you're all caught up. And you're, that's great. That's it. If you're you, a smart if, audience and you're with me. And Yeah. That is kind of nice when you don't have to tag it. And, uh, yeah, when I have to tag my DiGiorno joke, I get a little <laughs> disappointed with the audience. But then I let it go. And... Um, Joseph Scrimshaw, this has been a treat. Oh, thank you. This has been great. This is okay. So you have a New Year's Eve show in Portland, Oregon, with the Double Clicks, Yay! who are awesome. The yes, Double they Clicks. Are. People should listen to the Double Clicks because they are nerd, dork, comedy super geniuses, funny. Yep. super fun, very nice. Uh, two young ladies from Portland, Oregon, and you're going to be at New Year's Eve with the Double Clicks in Portland, Oregon. So go see Joseph Scrimshaw open for him. It's at Joseph Scrimshaw and josephscrimshaw dot com for all of your Joseph. Scrimshaw needs. <laughs> and uh, we can't wait for the next three or even one Star Wars movie, right? Yeah, I don't care if they're good or not. <laughs> Thanks for listening, folks. Take care out there. My hat, my hat, my hat. They're dancing around my hat. <laughs> my hat, my hat, my hat. Well, what do you think of that? If it looks like a Mexican hat dance and it sounds like a Mexican hat dance, it's most likely a Mexican hat dance. So take off your hat and let's dance. Yay! Oh my god. Thank we you. why don't we just call that as the end of the show?